Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about the rise of the American Reich, the potential for unprecedented and perhaps unlimited power. Our co-host for the show is Tim Apicella. Our esteemed guests for the show are Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar, and Manfred Henningsen, Emeritus Professor in Political Philosophy, UH Manoa. Welcome to you all to the show. We need to understand the potential for unprecedented power under Trump's return to the presidency. And Jean suggested I look at Arthur Schlesinger's imperial presidency highlighted during the Nixon administration. While past presidents have expanded their powers through military engagement and executive actions, Trump's is more potent due to the Supreme Court's ruling in Trump versus United States, the scariest and most ridiculous decision so far. Trump's vision is laid out, and as we now find, is laid out in Project 25, proposes significant changes like dismantling cabinet departments. These things depart from conventional checks and balances that uphold democratic government. And these things further signal a shift toward authoritarianism. In authoritarian regimes in history, leaders consolidated power. Take a look at Elon Musk and Vivek Ramswamy, uh, who will oversee drastic changes to the U.S. government in a, what Trump calls an expedited Manhattan Project. Trump's coalition could enable rapid fascistic transformations. So let me ask you guys, what do you think is happening? Do you make a parallel to 1933? Uh, do you make a parallel to the development of fascism, authoritarianism, dictatorship right now, uh, only a week after the election? Are, are indications of that uh, surfacing? You go first, Jean. What are your thoughts? Well, it isn't happening in a vacuum, Jay. We have the most resilient democratic government system in human history. We have 50 states with independent governments. Uh, that can resist at the local and state level any uh, ultimatums that come down from the national government. In fact, for most of our history, presidents have complained they haven't had enough power. Now, against that, we have to put the fact that this election has given Trump control over potentially the three branches of government, meaning he's got his judges in place at the Supreme Court. He could appoint more meaning that he has control over the Senate. And he's even when the House of Representatives has been in Democratic control, he has had a fifth column inside of that that has manipulated uh, whatever they could to uh, make the outcome uh, closer to his objectives. But Trump himself has given us a blueprint. Trump is an authoritarian personality, both psychologically and politically. He can be compared to Mussolini. I have compared him <laughs> in print um, and through research. And he, he also has a psychological portrait of a, a malignant narcissist, which is the general personality type for strong men and authoritarians. He has also told us exactly what he's going to do, and he's going to do it on day one and his wanting to put the Senate in recess. Remember, the Senate constitutionally is the one uh, branch of government that approves all appointments. He wants to put the Senate in recess in January so he can make what's called recess appointments without Senate oversight, as you noted. That is very, very worrisome. If that's the first thing he does, he has free reign to hollow out the civil service and to put his people, not only at the top, but also in the middle, where a lot of the work is really done in our government. We have perhaps the most efficient medical insurance system in um, our history. It's much more efficient than the private system, and that is Medicare. And he can uh, change rules with Medicare. He can, if he wishes, because he is a personality who overturns rules, regulations, and guardrails and has no comp com compunction about doing that. Um, he can make other major changes. But the first thing we need to look at 
is his consolidation of power, coercive power, in order to deport people. Once you identify a scapegoat, once you amass the military and police power to make that possible, you are well on your way to the recognizable uh, characteristic of authoritarian governments, which is to purge the body politic of any opposition, but also those that are considered less than, those who are dehumanized, those who are blamed for the ills of society. And if he does that to immigrants, he's going to do it with anyone who opposes him in the future. On the other side, we already have people and organizations set up that are recognizing the dangers and are already opposing him. Governors like Gavin Newsom, um, organizations like Indivisible, uh, public intellectuals like Jennifer Rubin, who's been consistent in recognizing fascism from day one and opposing it. And it's going to take our overcoming our indifference and apathy and demoralization to engage in this. Okay. Well, that's um, that's a happy thought. Tim, what are your thoughts about this? How far down the road are we uh, toward a dictatorship, uh, an American Reich, if you want? Well, I, I, I just shake my head every time I see headlines from CNN or, or other news sources saying shockwaves on the appointment of the AG, Matt Gates or shockwaves on cabinet uh, appointments. Um, really, shockwaves? Had we not been talking about this for years and all these, you know, uh, Jennifer Rubin and, and what we say on this show, have we not been talking about it? Where is the shockwave? Um, you know, I, it just boggles my mind as to how anyone could be shocked on what, he's what he has communicated since 2020 of what he wanted to do and how he was going to do it. So yes, he immediately is going to try to implement everything he can, as Gene said, to consolidate power. Why would he not? That's what he said he was going to do. Uh, these narcissists are very transparent when it comes to things they want to do. And and frankly, I think the first thing he does is tries to get his, his appointments through while the Senate is on break and uh, not, get, not obtain um, advice and consent. I think that's the first thing, because that's the easy thing to do. I think he'll go after the, you know, the low-hanging fruit. Um, what other low-hanging fruit would there be? Um, deportations. Uh, start, a, start a synergy, if you will, of things that he said he was going to do that uh, may or may not be in, in, in line with the law, but he's going to do them anyway. Who's going to challenge them at this point? The voters clearly said, do what you said you're going to do. That, that helps. You know, Tim, um, some of these appointments that he's announced are truly ridiculous, truly ridiculous. They're, they, they're out of the theater of the absurd. Um, these people are not qualified. Um, one after the other, not, not qualified. When has that stopped uh, Donald Trump in the past? Well, I'm wondering where that fits, where that fits in the consolidation of power to have unqualified members of his cabinet. Oh, it's easy. Um, if they're unqualified... I could push them aside because at some point they're going to say something very ridiculous in, in the media, and I can then push them aside and usurp that authoritative power unto myself as president of the United States and slowly, uh, by hiring the clown show, uh, consolidate their power unto me as president of the United States. Okay, Manfred, you know, you're a student of history, especially history in Europe, and when we talk about 1933, you're going to know plenty about that. How close are we to what was happening in 1933? I dislike somewhat this focus both Gene and him and put on Trump because one of the major differences between Germany in late 1932 and early 1933 is that you did not have a German mass movement bringing Hitler to power. It was a president, Hindenburg, who appointed him. It was a cabal, a conservative cabal. He never got in a free election the majority. What we have in the United States today, what we have today in the United States, is a president with the largest majority approving of him. 
So we should not simply talk about Trump. We know him. We should talk about what's wrong with the United States people to bring a guy like that through free elections, the freest elections that you can have in the world, to power. So it's not an issue of the psychology of, of Trump as a leader. It is the, the, the problem of the psychology of uh, the majority of Americans that voted him into power. So for me, you know, this focus on Hitler in 19, January 1933, I think is really beside the point. The United States today is, you could say, in worse shape than Germany was in at the end of 1932, because the majority at that time, the majority of Germans did not want Hitler in power. They, they, the elections for him in November of 1932 uh, went down. So please, there is something else that I find fascinating when we are talking about fascism. You know, I was just beginning to reread re an uh, extraordinary book that was published in 1963 by the German historian Ernst Nolte about fascism in, the, in its epoch. And he talks about the Accent Francaise, the French uh, fascist movement in Italy and national socialism. But one of the most fascinating things of the book is the United States is not mentioned. Now, I say it's the most fascinating thing because we know now that Hitler and uh, a lot of the members at the Wannsee conference in uh, January 42 in Berlin that planned the, the, the Holocaust, the final phase of uh, the extermination policies, they admired the Jim Crow laws and the American races. Uh, I mean, there's a book about Hitler's American model, the United States and the making of Nazi race law by James Whitman. But there are other studies about that. So when we are talking about fascism today and always look to Italy and Germany, no, we should look at the American roots of American fascism. And these roots are in the Jim Crow period, after the Civil War. And one of the most fascinating things about that period is from uh, 1867 uh, to the late 70s, that you have there an American president, Ulysses Grant, who was a military leader in, this, in the Northern, in, in, in the Civil War. And he became really the guy who was uh, fighting the Klan. Uh, and when you look, when you're reading this book to Ulysses Grant, the, the, the war against the, uh, the, the Klan, it is absolutely stunning. I mean, that is now the bloodiest beginning of uh, a political regime that you can uh, think of. The murders and lynchings that took place. Um, are stunning, but that is not part of American memory. It's not, I mean, what you have here, this layer of, of racism um, predates European fascism, even the French part, which is pr primarily anti-Semitic with the Dreyfus affair in, in the 1890s, uh, 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 and then Mussolini. Uh, so what you what is so fascinating about America today is there is no recognition. I mean, this focus of on Trump. Let me ask you this, though, Manfred. From what you say, it sounds like we are further advanced on the curve toward fascism uh, than they were in Germany in 1933. That yes. with all this history. We're moving faster. We're more advanced uh, toward fascism, toward an American Reich. I mean, what fascinates me reading this book uh, on Ulysses Grant, you know, in his fight against the Klan, <clears throat> what is so fascinating is that it is never, people don't refer to it, you know, not in the news uh, papers, in the commentary, nor in, in scholarship, you know, the, 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 the this indigenous American fascism that you had, especially in the South, the worst state was South Carolina, uh, <clears throat> is not part of the discussion. What does that mean, uh, that it's not part of the discussion? What I'm getting at is 
we need to, to get a bearing on how far advanced we are toward fascism, given our history, given everything that you've said. Yes, but what it means is that Americans have to begin to look very, very deep in the mirror and forget about looking at comparisons. No, the comparison is the American history that has not been uh, included in the understanding of uh, American politics. I'm going to go to Jean now for her comments on that. Jean, you've studied this and you've written about it um, and recently. Um, your thoughts about where we are on the continuum. Okay, first of all, Manfred makes some very good points. Those are points that I have studied and written about. And that is the development of American fascism as a varietal of fascism in general. But there is no doubt that what we are seeing with MAGA and Trump is a fascist movement for the first time in the mainstream and in presidential history. So we are at an inflection point, and we have to recognize that. And despite all of the warnings and information that has been put out, the American people have chosen a fascist. What we do about that is up to us. Uh, it is good making historical comparisons with Hitler and the rise of Hitler. First of all, Hitler was put into power by a consortium of conservatives who had lost faith in the Weimar Republic. And so they put him there thinking they could control him, and he turned around and controlled them. And his party did not have a majority at that time. But shortly afterward, as he continued using the legitimate system to validate his rule and consolidation of power, he did get a majority in the parliamentary system. We see this in Trump. The first time, he did not get a majority of the popular vote. He got the Electoral College. The second time, he got a majority of the popular vote. So we are further along the continuum. We are where Hitler took power and began to consolidate his power and began to, in effect, take over the Prussian army, the strongest part of the German military complex, and the German army. And then what he did is he conducted the Night of the Long Knives and got rid of his uh, own private army, which was very large, and helped him take power because they were not in sync with him. So with respect to where we are now, it takes more than one thing to make a train wreck. And even though we have this history of racism and KKK and Ku Klux Klan and, and, and uh, the rise of the Posse Comitatus and the Patriot Movement and um, the order in the 1990s and Aryan Nation and all these things that I've studied for years, we are also influenced by a worldwide trend toward global strongmen coming back into power because there is something going on with the human race right now, politically socially and spiritually. And it's there are many, many factors that play into this. Uh, mass migrations is one of them. And the polarization with Russian and Chinese determination to overthrow the Pax Americana. We've talked about this. So we have to look at much more. And historical parallels help us anticipate what could happen. When Trump took power the first time, I thought this guy He's, he's kind of ridiculous, but, you know, he's got a mass following and he's got a movement. He never talks about a party. He talks about a movement. But then as he began to grow and grow and grow, as did the National Socialists when Hitler took over in Munich, then you see how he institutionalizes it, how his uh, not following law or rules or decorum appeals how people who are demoralized opt out of the system and don't oppose him. This is the same process we have seen historically in these types of authoritarian regimes. And I recommend everybody who's listening to this to read The Anatomy of Fascism by Robert O. Paxton. Um, Tim, I want to I want to ask you this, you know, back in 33 there were those historians who said that Hitler could have been stopped if the German people wanted to stop him, but they didn't. What, what the, the events that uh, Manfred described just went on, and ultimately people in Germany accepted Hitler, uh, as they did in Austria, same thing. 
And so the, the question is, uh, what, what, if anything, uh, can, can we do now? You know, to stop the, the, the movement toward fascism in the 30s, it took FDR and it took a war, a war with, you know, two ax axes, um, a war first with Japan and then also Germany. And, and those events gave us guardrails against the movement toward fascism in this country. That's my view of it anyway. Uh, what is your view? What, what guardrails um, are in place or could be in place um, to stop this movement toward fascism? Well, we talked about it at the last show. And uh, in my write-up, I suggested that the Democrat Party needs to completely dismantle itself and rebuild itself. Um, I'll, I'll talk about why this, this election was lost for the Harris Waltz team. They failed to get a message, an effective message to the working class poor and the working class middle class. Um, their messages about happy days are here again because we have economic indicators of low unemployment, of uh, inflation has come down significantly, GNP is up, all these rosy economic caters that appeal to maybe college educated individuals, but they don't translate to the working blue collar person of, of almost every state. And, and their, their messaging failed on that. Um, they forgot to acknowledge that uh, living wage was not increasing as fast as inflation. And, and what you don't want is def, def, you know, deflation. So those prices are here to stay, and we have to catch up with our, our working wages to the price of inflation today. And the Harris campaign failed to do that. They failed to address why I can't pay for all my bills on my kitchen table because my wages have not been increased. And they failed miserably at that. Again, talking over people's heads with economic indicators doesn't put food on the table. And so if you want to address how you stop fascism, you're gonna to have to address the problems that people are facing today, right now, uh, with too many bills and not enough income to pay those bills. So I would start working on my 2026 campaign like next week. Uh, Donald Trump did it. Uh, there wasn't more than a, a two week period where Donald Trump wasn't running for office. Uh, he let January 6th take place. And he waited a couple of weeks, and wasn't he holding rallies as early as uh, February 2020 for 2024 election? So the answer is the Democrats better start working on that same tact. Manfred, um, let's assume for a moment, I, I, I imagine you would agree, that we are on a track here that will lead us to um, greater authoritarian government in this country. And, and that's where Trump is headed, and he's in power. And his friends are supporting him and so forth. Um, where does it go from here? What's, what's the evolution of, of this movement from here? You mean the Trump movement? Yeah. I have not the slightest idea. And uh, <laughs> Tim was, is right, you know, that the Democratic Party has to uh, re- uh, construct itself, reinvent itself. Uh, and I don't think it is the bread and butter issues that people are, and the, and the working class uh, that people are mentioned, but Tim mentioned that also. Uh, what is the, uh, someone has to explain to me the apathy of the registered Democrats who didn't vote. What uh, was the reason for that apathy? Is that misogyny because uh, a lot of them didn't want to have a woman as president? I mean, as I mentioned in, in a session earlier, uh, the United States is the only Western country that didn't have so far a political leader uh, like uh, Maggie Thatcher or Angela Merkel. Is that going to get better? I, I mean, let's assume that voting continues and we have midterms and we have another election coming. Um, what, 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 what is that going to get better? Are those people going to understand going forward? Are they going to uh, push back on what Trump is doing or not? Well, look, uh, people said uh, the 100 days were too short uh, for uh, uh, Harris, you know, to bring them a new message across. There was no new message. It was the Biden message. Uh, and in that sense, you know, uh, 
it was really a continuation of the Biden presidency. And for some strange reason, uh, even though he got elected in 20, uh, it didn't become uh, repeated. Uh, now, I think the Democratic Party has uh, to, well, certainly find a charismatic uh, representative, you know, who can uh, present uh, himself or herself uh, in a persuasive way that make people want to get rid of Trump and the Trump movement. Um, I don't know whether Newsom is that uh, figure, uh, but I cannot point to anyone else, you know, who has that stuff uh, has been visible as that potential candidate. But remember, one thing that I wanted to emphasize also, when you're talking about Hitler in the 30s, uh, and you always mentioned FDR, that FDR defeated him, he didn't. FDR, you know, didn't do anything about uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, they didn't even let uh, immigrant, Jewish immigrants from, from Germany come in and fill the quota. The quota was open, you know, 30 or 40,000 numbers were open. They, the, the State Department refused to let German Jews use that quota to come into the United States. FDR became the enemy when Pearl Harbor happened. Then And then uh, you have in, one day later, the German and Italian declaration of war. That's what brought FDR, you know, uh, into the, the picture. It was not in the 30s. And the interesting thing, you know, about uh, the New Deal also was that some of the Nazis really liked these policies and wanted to, to imitate some of them. They were not only interested in the race laws uh, of Jim Crow that they imitated, you know, when they drafted the, uh, the race laws in 1935 uh, <clears throat> and then in the Manse conference, you know, used uh, the violence against blacks in order to justify uh, what they were going to plan. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I go with Tim and say, you know, that the Democratic Party has to reinvent itself and maybe the Republican Party, party also. That's a long shot because uh, Trump, uh, uh, Trump controls the Republican Party, Manfred. And we'll continue to, especially now that he's in office. But Jane, I, I want to ask you the same question. Where are we on the continuum? <laughs> You've studied the evolution of fascism in various places. Uh, and we know we have mm, indications of it here, uh, as, as uh, were significantly expressed last week. Um, but um, where does it go from here? If you, if you see Germany and Italy as models, something to study. Uh, what can we, what should we be thinking about in terms of the steps to follow? We have models from history. We have comparisons, but we do not have exact parallels. There are many ways you can critique um, the rise, uh, comparing the rise of fascism here and the rise of fascism in Germany before World War II. Um, but to be very honest with you, there is a general pattern, what's called a paradigm. And if you can identify that, you know where you're going, but you never can predict. You cannot predict what's going to happen. You can anticipate. You can pick out what to look at and what to follow. And the first thing you wanna know about fascism is it succeeds through violence, coercion, fear, and also, through unifying the perception of authority in one place, the same place where the power is concentrated. So one reason why Trump was a president in waiting, as I call him, between his two administrations is that he kept up the rallies, he kept himself in the news, he involved himself in, in presidential activities, 
with the legislature and with foreign leaders. And he was treated as a major political leader and authority in the press, even when they were exposing what he did. A lot of people found that very, very attractive. These parallels are very useful, but they can't tell us where we're going. And I was going to say in answer to your question, Jay, that it's going to totally depend on the strength of our system at the local and state levels and in the power of our information industry in terms of getting people's approval and pointing them into the right direction in terms of, of evaluating what Trump starts to do, because he can't do everything, even with his movement. And there is no GOP party anymore. There is a movement, a fascist movement, and there is one political party, and that political party is already doing an autopsy of what happened. Mm. Autopsy of for dead people. The Democratic you know, Party is dead. I, I think so. <laughs> So uh, I don't see any indications there's a there's a second coming here, um, but maybe we will see that. My question to you is something that Gene mentioned, and that is one of our favorite topics: the media. Is the media up to the job of preserving our country now? Well, we we have some deficits. Uh, remember the local markets. Gene's spot on. The lo you know all politics start locally. Uh, spot on with that comment, because what companies that are very conservative, very Christian kind of oriented, very uh, Trumpish, what two, what two media major media companies owns a significant portion of the what I call rural media and local media? That's Salem and Sinclair. They're already uh, have established a dominance in these local markets. Uh, they're going to be contrary to any any um, fair and balanced reporting. Uh, I listen to conservative media all the time on AM radio, and the things they say is like, "You've got to be kidding me!" But they've been very busy, very busy bees for many years, and uh, they will now even ramp that up. You'll see out and out propaganda uh, coming out of these airwaves. So, what what will the media do to? Uh, uh, try to push off the uh, negative effects of fascism? I don't know. I don't have that answer. Uh, it's an uphill slog. It's going to be very, very difficult to uh, ga gain the narrative on where America needs to go with the democracy, the Constitution, and the rule of law. That's an uphill push. We're about out of time here. and I, I want to go around the table and ask for your, your thoughts that you want to leave with our audience. But one thing I would ask you is, uh, how do you how do you feel about this? How do you feel about how uh, fascism, a Third Reich, uh, or rather an American Reich, uh, would affect your life and the lives of your family, and uh, your community, uh, and you know the economy around you? How do you think that would affect you? And then the second question uh, I hope you will address is what you know if. If if your child asks you, what did you do, Daddy, at the at this inflection point when we were becoming a, an autocracy, what would your answer be? Not only in what you have done, because you've been on think tech, that is something, but what you would do and what you advise them to do. Manfred, let's start with you. How would life be and what steps would you take? I'm not returning to Germany, I'm staying here in the blue state of the nation. Uh, so for that reason, <laughs> that's my personal answer. In the long run, I still believe, and you won't believe it, I believe in the majority of Americans uh, being smarter than they uh, showed in this election. They will come back to their senses. So for that reason, I think this is, uh, an episode, a very powerful, sickening episode, but I don't think it will be de define American politics uh, for the next decade. Okay, um, that suggests uh, prayer on a daily basis. Uh, Gene, your thoughts about the same thing? Um, you know, how would it affect your life and the lives of the people around you? 
And what, if anything, can you do to uh, assist in the resistance? <laughs> the only thing I'm really good at, I'm going to continue to do. <laughs> I have a bunch of papers I'm going to consolidate um, from my 30 years of study of religion and violence in the United States and around the world. And I'm going to see where those papers take me in terms of publication and uh, perhaps getting them out there in more modern guise in uh, the organs of information we are using now. I think that this uh, change, this great social and political change that we are undergoing um, has a lot to do with one of the great revolutions in human history, which is the technical uh, revolution. And this is the first time we have created devices uh, for the extension of human thought. We've created uh, technologies for the extension of human labor, for the use of our hands and our feet uh, and our bodies, but never for our brains. And so look out, this is not, uh, <laughs> this is a fast ride and we don't know where it's going. But I feel taking the long view that um, I'll retreat to my study, I'll do my things. I may join a few organizations, I will support those that I feel are leading the charge. And I would advise my children and have already advised them to have a plan B if things really go south. I mean, things could go well too, you never know. I mean, the system could work. In 2022, the Democrats could get their act together and win back one of the houses of Congress. In 2024, we could have uh, such disenchantment with what Trump has done and the mess he has made, or we could have, uh, greater adulation for a dictator. We don't know. But in the meantime, everybody needs a plan B. And I'm sticking with the United States. <laughs> and uh, my kids, they may take a hiatus. They may take uh, some time out. But they'll be back and be contributing members of society, too. OK, Tim, uh, your thoughts on those questions? Uh, what would life be like for you and the people around you? And what would you do? Um, to try to um, slow this movement down? And how optimistic are you? Uh, take the last part first. Uh, I am not horribly optimistic. I think we're going to see an erosion of the rule of law openly. I think we're going to see an erosion of uh, our Bill of Rights openly. I think it takes time to get there, um, you know, one inch at a time. I don't see a lot of hope that the population is going to realize what they've done as far as in the form of buyer's remorse. Uh, I think most people, unfortunately, are, use the catchphrase, I don't pay attention to politics. And unfortunately, they don't realize politics rule, runs and rules their daily lives, whether they see it or not, whether they acknowledge it or not. So as far as um, my future, I think I have a plan B, as Gene has uh, mentioned. And I, to follow what uh, Manfred said, I live in one of the more blue states in the country, and I like that. And uh, I will try to keep my guard on, on guard. Uh, a lot of my energies took place before the election, and I'm not certain to what degree I'm going to extend those energies to continually bring up Donald Trump and speak his, his, his name out of my mouth, because uh, I did a lot of that for seven years. And um, I'm a little fatigued, as you well know. So uh, I'll be on the up and up. But, uh, I'm cautiously uh, guarded right now. Cautiously guarded. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Manfred. Thank you, Gene. See you next time. Aloha. 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 Aloha.